What's up, everybody? Um, a little bit outside of your normal programming, but we have a very special guest. Uh, okay, I'll let everyone pile in here first. I always forget that not everyone's in right at the instant that I go on, so then I'm nervous, so I just start talking. Okay, I'll let people get in here. Do, do, do. Okay. Um, I am so excited um, for the next guest on my program. <laughs> it's not really a program, I'm just doing it by myself in my living room. Um, we have Yamish Alcindor on today. She is uh, with PBS NewsHour and she is their White House correspondent. Um, so as you can imagine, she's in the thick of it doing uh, the business during this coronavirus. So I can't wait to talk to her about um, all things White House press briefings, um, but much broader than that. So um, as always, bear with me as I try to, you know, figure this thing out. Try to get her in here. See if more people pour in. View. Okay. She's not in yet. Give her a minute. Oh, shout out Riley Rampone. Hey girl, miss you. Okay, let some more people get in here. I'll try to find her. Maybe I should be a White House correspondent. <laughs> Could you imagine? Could you imagine? Can't imagine I'd be able to get a credential, but I'm trying. Okay, still looking. up w kamau's in here how you doing okay i think maybe i've got to go find where she's at this is always the fun part where i start to sweat and get nervous i can't find my people Okay, still looking. Did I, maybe I missed her somewhere. Okay. Has anyone seen her? The Indom. Looking, looking, looking. Can you search people? Hmm. I wonder. Are you hogging the front room? Yeah, kind of. This is a late night one, so she didn't have anything planned. Okay, let me see. Let me get in here. Ah, there she is. Okay, disaster averted. Let's go in here. I was so worried I was going to be like Teddy Riley and everyone. I was like, oh my God. I was like, no, are we going to be <laughs> we did Teddy it. Riley? <laughs> that was really tragic. Um, Sue was like <laughs> hyped all week. <laughs> She was hyped all week for it, and it was just like it wasn't happening, and they they couldn't figure out what was going on. I feel their pain every every time I get on one of these, which I'm doing a lot. I'm like, this could be a disaster, but it always works out. But you know, right. it's, it's stressful either way. Um, Yamish Alcindor, welcome to um, my pretend program, but thank you for coming on. Uh, so excited to have you. Um, how are you? 
Thank you so much for having me on. I'm like a bit starstruck, but it's really, really cool to talk to you. <laughs> Likewise. Because um, you know, you're like a world champion. Um, <laughs> just We're going to just chat it up on IG. Um, True to chat. But I'm doing well. I mean, it's these are obviously really, really, really tough times. There's, of course, the coronavirus pandemic, which has just killed so many people. And so many people, I think, are in mourning in our country right now. It's, it's a really deep moment of grief. The other thing that's happening is that we're still seeing other terrible stories going on today. I was spending a lot of time reporting on Ahmad Aubrey's um, story and his death. The two men who, at least two of the men who chased him were just arrested just a couple moments ago. Um, the announcement went out. I talked to his dad and his lawyer and the, and the family member's lawyer um, on PBS NewsHour tonight. So I'm, I'm doing well, but you know, things are just so tough right now. It really is. Um, I feel like we're having it's like uh, tragedies on top of disasters on top of the coronavirus on top of the, you know, this thing that the whole world is dealing with. And we just have no idea. And in a way it doesn't even feel like we're trying to figure out exactly how to, you know, deal with the grief um, and the tragedy and people are scared. And then on top of it, you have, you know, the stories that you were, you were just talking about. I just saw before I came on, um, the two men were, were finally arrested. Um, and it seems like the, the third man um, who was, I guess, driving in a pickup truck behind, um, behind the two suspects filming, it sounds like he uh, might also be arrested soon. So it's just, um, I mean, I was happy to, I guess, finally see that um, they had been arrested. Um, I can't believe it, it took this long. Uh, but I think everybody, you know, probably feels safer that they're at least off the streets um, and in custody. But yeah, it's been, um, you know, that's been obviously circling around social media so much. Um, but it's, a, it's just, you know, another horrible tragedy. And uh, it's, it's hard to even put, put words on it. Um, you know, it's, it's like you want to call it a tragedy, you want to call it all these things. But, um, you know, it's a systemic um, issue in our country and it's um you know you know you've covered so i mean so much in your career um it's you know you're you're in the white house right now but you you started out um you know covering the murder of don't mind Trayvon. me while i back this up just a little <laughs> okay yeah no worries Pull this um, <laughs> you know you've uh yeah you you've covered the murder of um trayvon martin um, you've covered the protests in Ferguson, Missouri, after Michael mm -hmm. Brown um, was was um, gunned down. Are there any, you know, sort of parallels that you can take to reporting in and around tragedies and events at a time in the country when things are so polarized? I think of the country now um, during coronavirus, and you know, it, it shouldn't be as political and as polarizing as it is, but what is it like to report around, you know, a specific issue, but then you have these, these sort of, you know, polarizing and politicizing of the issues as well. How, how do you process that? And what is your process of, of reporting those issues while, while dealing with the polarization and, and the kind of split political environment that we have? I should say, I mean, I became a reporter because I heard about the story of Emmett Till um, who was this 14-year-old Black boy who was murdered in 1955 and who sparked the civil rights movement. Rosa Parks talk about, talks about the fact um, and talked about the fact that he was the catalyst that got her involved in civil rights. And he, his mother um, had an open casket funeral for him that showed this, his disfigured face and what people had done to her teenager. And when I think about that and I think about that that is my origin story too that Emmett Till is literally what got me into journalism I think that yes they're going to be polarized sides people are going to have their own sets of opinions and people are going to use the facts in the ways that they think um, are beneficial to their side but I still think that at the end of the day it's about facts and it's about truth and it's about justice so when I do my reporting whether it's at the White House or it's another sad fatal killing of a black man who was unarmed because he was jogging in, as in today's um, story. I think about the fact that like, that's what, I, that's what I was put on this earth to do. It was to report the news. It was to be a truth teller. And it was to talk um, to people about all the ways that America is still not at all perfect and all of its flaws. 
Mm, yeah. So it's, it's almost like your origin story, but also just you being an American citizen, that sort of informs the way that, that you report. You're like, I need to get the facts out there. Um, I need to do it, you know, in, in a way that's up to the journalistic standards, but also understanding that, you know, the, the facts and the true story isn't, isn't always out there. Um, that, that's so interesting. Um, I mean, you're, you're, uh, I saw your interview with, um, Aubrey's father, um, Mr. Aubrey's father and his lawyer. How do you prepare for an interview like that? That's, I mean, it's, it, clearly so heavy it's such an emotional moment but it's so important as well and necessary for people to to you know to hear that and to be a part of that what goes into your reporting how do you approach that i approach it like i do almost every assignment which is focusing on getting to know the story as best as i possibly can so in the case of ahmaud aubrey i read every single story i possibly could i thought about my questions for a really, really long time. I try to put myself in the shoes of that family as, a, as someone who has an African-American husband, an African-American brother, so many African-American family members that are men. I mean, of course, as, as myself, as an African-American woman, I just kept thinking about like, what would I want someone to ask me and what would I <laughs> want to have um, the space to, to talk about? So for me, I talked about obviously the, the story itself and, and what was going on with the two men not being arrested at the time and then the, the wants of the family. But I also talked about kind of who do you want people to know about? What, what do you want people to know about your son? And his father told me tonight that he was a good boy, that he was someone who enjoyed working out, that he was trying to be healthy in the middle of this pandemic, that he had been jogging on that in that same neighborhood for years, that he mm -hmm. was someone who was familiar to it. He was in a familiar space that he shouldn't have feared for his life. But at the same time that his father said that he had talked to him about Trayvon Martin. And I think what's remarkable is that uh, Ahmaud Aubrey gets killed February 23rd, 2020. The anniversary of Trayvon Martin's death and the day that he died was February 26, 2012. So it's almost like we're back in some way, in some people's minds, we're back reliving this thing where this man gets shot trying to, trying to just go about his life. And now we have to wait and we have to listen to protesters demand justice and only then do authorities take a second look and decide actually these men should be charged with murder. So imagine today they're Gregory McMichael and Travis McMichael are charged with murder and aggravated assault. That didn't, that would not have happened in the minds of Aubrey's family, um, in the minds of Ahmaud Aubrey's family, if that, if there wasn't a national push to do that, if there wasn't video showing exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's actually, re you know, remarkable to think that you know, all these years on from Trayvon Martin, and obviously Trayvon Martin was, was not the first, you know, unarmed man of color to be, um, to be gunned down, whether it's by the police or, um, you know, a lynch mob, as um, the father was calling it today. Do you see, what's it, do you see, you know, progress or maybe regress in the, you know, the, the way that we are covering this, the reporting of it, the way that we're handling this as a country, and even just from a, from the media's perspective, do you, what's the difference you see in these, you know, these two cases, maybe all these years apart, like, have we made progress? And ha how is that? It's, it's, it seems like we haven't in a lot of ways. And we sort of keep going back to the same, same thing. How has the reporting changed from from the, all those years? Well, I think what's something that's really something that's where we've made progress, but where it's also, I think, um, in our minds, still we're still the same thing as his, his dad told me something today that I thought was really really profound which is that you know this has been happening for so long we feel like we've been being lynched for so long we feel like these lynch mobs and these people um white men in particular can pursue us and follow us around but that we somehow still will not get justice so I think in his father's mind um the country has not changed that much which is I think really kind of sad I also think of the people though who would say that if we were talking about this in 1950s, we wouldn't have a conversation. First of all, I probably wouldn't be a White House correspondent. You also wouldn't have other Black journalists around the country telling the story, other journalists in, in general telling the story. Um, and these men probably maybe would have gotten would have would have gotten away with seemingly what some people think of as murder. So of course the facts are still being learned, and these men are, are innocent until proven guilty. Um, and the legal system has to do its work, and there's due process, but. It's almost, in most people's minds, if these men had followed Aubrey, um, Ahmaud Aubrey, 
in Georgia in 1950, they would have just gotten away with it and it would have been, and they would have murdered him if that's what, if that's what the facts end up it being. Um, and, and it would have been fine and there would have been literally no prosecution. I think what makes yeah. 2020 different is that there are voices and black lawyers and all these people who are demanding justice. And as a result, these men are arrested. Who knows what happens after that? Because George Zimmerman was arrested. And then I covered, as I covered his trial, he obviously was found not guilty. So people think that that case was something that resulted at the end of the day with no justice for that family. Um, but the fact is that we still know George Zimmerman's name. So I think there are a lot of people who also think even if George Zimmerman is walking around free, he still has to contend with the fact that his name will forever be connected to Trayvon Martin and everywhere he goes and everything that he does will be connected to Trayvon Martin. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's such a, a tragic story for Ahmaud Aubrey, and we, you know, of course, wish his family just our deepest condolences. It, it's so sad. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, you mentioned your, your White House correspondence post. Um, it seems you were kind of thrust into the national spotlight, um, as so often happens with um, Donald Trump berating people and going after them. Uh, I have a little bit of experience with, with uh, that myself. Um, but you've become also one of the really? most important. Yeah, just a little bit. Just a little bit. Just a little yeah. bit. Much like you, I just continued to do my job. It worked out. It worked out okay. Um, but, you know, it, it's so it's, you know, it, it's so interesting when he does that, too, because I feel like he's trying to sort of take people down, but then he ends up kind of like elevating them in, the, in this other way. And I think, you know, that's definitely happened with you. You've become, you know, in my opinion, one of the one of the most important uh, voices coming out of uh, the White House press briefings. I have so many questions about the White House press briefings. Um, I'm just, I'm just going to start firing, firing questions away. Um, who's in there? How do you get in there? Um, you know, how does each network choose who they're, you know, they're going to put in there? How many people are in there? Um, obviously, it's changed quite a bit with social distancing and having to, you know, stick with the guidelines. Um, so you guys are kind of far apart, but just kind of break down a little bit of like, what is a White House correspondent? How do you get there? And like, what's what's the path to, to be there? Um, it depends. I, I think that there are a lot of different paths to becoming a White House correspondent. For me, um, I just, the way that I, I never really thought I was going to become a White House correspondent. Um, I thought that I would just be, in my mind, my goal was to be a local news reporter. I'm from Miami, so the, the dream job for me was working at the Miami Herald. I wanted to be um, covering my community, covering my hometown. Um, so I graduated in 2009 with literally no job and I was super, super worried that I was not gonna be able to be employed. Um, and my immigrant parents, I'm Haitian, so my immigrant parents were like, why aren't you being a lawyer? This is ridiculous. Like figure your life out. <laughs> um, but for me, I decided to, to take a bunch of different internships and start off making a, not much money um, working for Newsday in Long Island. And I just was a, a local cops reporter that then became a national breaking news reporter covering Trayvon Martin and Ferguson, the protests in Ferguson. And then I went on to be a national political reporter for the New York Times. And then I ended up being a White House correspondent. I think that um, there are a lot of White House correspondents who also, there used to be an older way of doing things where you would spend maybe 20 years reporting and then you could be kind of honored with the job of the White House correspondent. It's still a prestigious job, but there, there's a young new generation of White House correspondents um, that are being able to get these jobs and be in these positions um, faster than in the past. So you have a generation, millennial really, White House correspondents that are covering the president. I think it's interesting because when I think about President Trump, I think so much of him is about reality TV. So much of him is lost if you didn't watch The Apprentice because you realize that he was a reality TV star who used that 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 celebrity to then get into the White House. So to me, um, it's an interesting way to, to think about it because I know that there's a lot of, there are a lot of also older White House correspondents who help me so much when it comes to context. Because almost every day I'm wondering like, was that normal? Is that okay? Like, what was that? Like Peter Baker at the New York Times, I ask him all the time like, what like is that in contest or like Judy Woodruff who is uh, the anchor at PBS News Hour? She covered Reagan, and I always ask her. I'm like, oh, is covering Reagan like this? And she was like, no, covering Reagan is not like this. Yeah, I know. I mean, I think all of us watching at home because the you know the Trump administration um, before the coronavirus they weren't doing daily press briefings. Certainly, uh, the president was, and even I think the the press secretary, whatever they're called, they weren't doing them all the time. And now it's sort of this new thing for the American people as well. We're like, 
oh my God, we, we, you know, have the president of the United States during a pandemic, of course, they're going to speak um, every day. But um, they've been interesting, to say the least. I'm kind of thinking every day, I'm like, I was thinking this for a while. And then actually, when we when we spoke offline, you, you told me I was like, how are they not all getting kicked out? I'm like, there's no way that Yamisha's going to be allowed back in like Trump hates her. And like, he went after her. I'm like, Jim Acosta, you're out of there. Like, you're never coming back in. But it's a totally separate. Obviously, it makes sense now the press is, is separate and free. So you guys kind of have your own organization. And like, you know, once you're in that, then you can go in there. Obviously, you're you're not sort of like under the, um, you know, administrations, um, allowing you guys in you have your own separate thing. Is that right? That's right. And it, those are great questions because I think I didn't realize how much people didn't understand this until I was talking to my husband, who's also a reporter. And he was like, wait, there's a White House Correspondents Association. How does that work? And that was just a couple days ago, weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, so how it all works is that there's a White House Correspondents Association. That association, most co correspondents are members of that organization. They then work to with the White House as a sort of liaison to figure out like, okay, who's going to sit in the press briefing room? Who, what, are, what seats are going to be assigned to who? How are we going to do this? We often talk about the White House pool. The White House pool is just like a group of small, like a select group of reporters that's constantly changing, people rotating, rotating in and out who cover the president um, every day. So in that regard, the access to the briefing room is controlled by and large by the White House Correspondents Association. Right now, people haven't seen me as much in the White House briefings or interacting with President Trump because we have social distancing rules and order. So there are very fewer um, White House correspondents who are going to the briefings. So I'm going tomorrow actually at the White House. It's my turn to be at the White House and be in, in, in the briefing room if there's a press briefing. But a lot of it is, is, is dictated by reporters who we've elected to, to, to represent us when we talk to the White House. So our president is John Carl, the ABC White House correspondent, a really great guy. Um, and there are a number of other officials that are part of that association. Okay. Trump's probably thrilled with only a few of you being, being able to be there <laughs> at any given time. <laughs> You're not allowed to say that. I can say that. I won't put you in an awkward position. You got to keep it neutral. You're a reporter. Um, you, you have done, um, at least in my opinion, um, and I think the opinion of a lot of people, an exceptional job at contextualizing what President Trump is saying from, uh, you know, as the briefing is going on um, from day to day, from week to week, and then from month to month. So as just a normal citizen watching, uh, it has been, you know, hard to follow at times. What, what are we doing? What is the strategy? Are we staying in? Are we coming out? Um, you've just done an amazing job at sort of, you know, in the moment, in real time, being, being able to put everything together. What is your process behind that? Like, how do you do that? Because you kind of have to, like, have all the knowledge that came before. Okay, what is he, you know, saying? What is he trying to say? What does this actually mean? How, how is your process when you sort of put all that together? Because it's made it really easy, you know, either just following your threads or following what you're saying to sort of, like, have a coherent, you know, I guess, reporting of what's been happening in the press briefings so for me it goes back to research the the, the question you asked me about kind of how did i prepare for Maude aubrey its father's interview and, and the lawyer it's the same thing to me it's reading a ton so for me i i'm constantly thinking like what's happening right now what's the latest in the news obviously as you can tell news is constantly changing so i'm trying to just figure out what are the top issues that are going on with the pandemic usually it's still testing it's still medical equipment they're kind of the issues that have been with us from the very beginning and the fact that we still don't have adequate testing, that hospitals still are struggling with um, per personal protective equipment. And then it's also because President Trump often does say misleading things, it's getting myself familiar with what, was, what has he been saying lately that I should already be ready to fact check? And what has he said in the past that I wanna ask about? So one thing the president said in, in March, um, anyone who wants a test will be able to get a test. When, of course, that wasn't true then and it's not true now. So trying to come up with ways to do that. And then every day when I'm at the White House briefing, I have a list of questions that I wanna ask President Trump. I usually have them written out. As someone who is really interested in social justice and racial justice, I always have questions that are about that are about race and about and about um, justice and vulnerable populations, people who I think will never possibly maybe never make it to the White House who deserve to have their voices heard. Um, I also have my mom who's a social worker who often throws me all sorts of questions. Most of them I don't ask because <laughs> my mom and she's- Yeah, she's mom. gonna keep sending them for sure. <laughs> but she's definitely gonna keep sending them. So 
that's basically how I do it. But a lot of it, when you see me kind of go at the president, like the last time, where one of the most recent times the president was in the middle of, I asked him a question about um, why he hadn't warned people sooner about the, the, the seriousness of the coronavirus. And I said that I had interviewed a guy whose family members, 15 of them, um, got the coronavirus, he thinks. W you know, what would you say to him who, who told me that he, if he had it, if the president had been more serious, he might have also taken it more serious. And the president said, well, I haven't left the White House for several months. And I said, actually, you left, you, you left the White House pretty recently. In yeah. March, you held a rally in North Carolina. So it was, it's that kind of real-time fact-checking that I think makes my reporting unique. Um, it all, it's also makes, I think, the PBS NewsHour unique because we are so grounded in the facts and just trying to tell people what's been going on and what the truth is. Yes, I, I love how you said that your reporting is unique. I think it seems to me, um, and being a, a Black woman in the White House press room, but having your roots sort of in social justice and um, you know, in cases like Trayvon Martin and in the protests, does all of that sort of inform you going into the White House? So it's like, yes, you're, you know, reporting on the coronavirus right now, maybe, but we've seen with the coronavirus, um, you know, the, the disproportionate effect on people of color and on the immigrant communities and all of that. So you sort of try to tie all of that in together and not just focus on, you know, maybe what they're saying on the day. Exactly. So for me, because I'm so focused on social justice, it's always in the back of my mind, mainly because one, I like, I've covered all these stories between Trayvon Martin and Ferguson and the death of Freddie Gray. Um, I've also lived those experiences and being someone who's African American, who's Haitian American, who has family members and friends who have had their own issues with, with racial profiling. And then I really think about the fact that race is something that is that is and should be a top story in America almost every day. I mean, mm -hmm. any issue and there is a racial component to that. So with the coronavirus, we talk about how many people are dying. In most cities, what we're seeing is that there's an elevated number of deaths when it comes to African Americans. In Washington, D.C., where the president obviously lives, the, the cases that are in war, in a war that is most African American are where most of the deaths are happening. You think about Chicago, they're they are African Americans are less than 30% of the population, but there's some 70% about of the deaths from coronavirus. So that's just like, you don't have to try hard to see that race in the coronavirus is super important. I also think that when I'm covering the White House, I can't ignore the other stories that are happening. I got on the Ahmaud Aubrey story because I saw the video and was literally sick into my stomach and thought, we should, I want to know more about the situation. It's not about condemning the men who shot him before, like the, the, the due process, but it's about saying, we, sh we need to know more about this case. I want to know what his dad has to say, what his lawyer has to say, what the police have to say, what the mm -hmm. district attorney who said, who said almost after looking at all of the evidence that he thought that they were making a rightful um, arrest, that they, were, that they were doing what they thought was right to do and that it was a self-defense killing. And as a result, he didn't think that they should be charged. I want to talk to all of those people and understand what's going on in our society. So I think covering the White House, you can't ignore any of the things that are going on, including the social and racial inequities. Yeah, well, it's all, it's all really tied together, too. I mean, I think in the coronavirus, you've seen not only COVID affecting um, colors, uh, communities of color disproportionately, you know, versus other, but you're also seeing, um, looks like an uptick in policing in certain neighborhoods versus other neighborhoods, um, especially in New York City. Um, you know, over the whole Trump presidency, you've seen an uptick in, um, you know, violence against minorities and against immigrants and people of color and just, um, you know, violence and, and hate crimes in general. Um, and I think it's really important that when we are telling the story, which is what, you know, the, the press in my mind, you're supposed to tell the whole story. It's like the whole point of having everybody at the table is not so we can tick boxes off. It's so we can tell the entire story. And so we can get everybody to, it's like, this is what's affecting my community. It might be something different than is affecting, I don't know, Jim Acosta's community, but he's going to bring that in and talk about, you know, the different thing. And then we, as a society, we can get the whole picture of what's happening in our world all the time. So from, from a viewer, we're very appreciative of, um, of you always, you know, tying in those threads because they're not separate things. Um, it's, it's all the same thing. It's the world we live in. Um, you know, everyone thinks, okay, this virus came and now, you know, communities of color having disproportionate, disproportionate effects on it. Well, there's a reason for that, that we should understand better. So we all appreciate uh, all of the work that you're, that you're doing. Um, 
switching gears a little bit. Um, so you've covered a few presidential campaigns, right? I think you're on the 16 trail, a little bit of Trump and a little bit of Bernie Sanders. Um, a lot of Bernie, of the... a little bit of Trump. <laughs> A yeah, a lot of Bernie, a lot of Bernie, a little bit of I Trump. Listened to like, I, I listened to like 350 speeches for Bernie. Like, it was a lot of Bernie. Wow. <laughs> Dang. That's a lot. That's, he's consistent, too. That's, that's a lot of... He's that's highly a lot of, consistent. He's highly <laughs> consistent, yeah. He's very much so. Uh, you've moderated a debate. Um, what's the most challenging parts of covering a, a presidential campaign in... in you know, the debates, of course, when everyone is like, literally and figuratively, like yelling their best foot forward, everyone's trying to get their point across. And again, sort of like the, the briefings, how do you distill all that information down? And then, uh, you know, process what you're going to answer next? Or, or how do you kind of deal with that? I think that that's so interesting, because I look at those debates, and I'm like, Oh, my God, that's great. How do you not just sit there? Like, this is insane. <laughs> Well, I would almost ask that question about like when you're playing soccer in front of a millions of people, how do you not just like <laughs> collapse onto yourself and say like, yeah, I can't play with all these people. Can you guys all go home? And then I'll win the this. World Cup when you leave. But since I will, but I won't ask the questions tonight, so I'll answer. Um, I think that- Yeah, the me, roles are flipped me, tonight. Right, very weird. Um, but I think that there are two ways. I mean, when, when you're on the campaign trail, there's the physical aspect of the job. It's a grind. You're on a bus. I le I lived from a, a suitcase. Um, my husband, when we were getting, we got engaged um, in 2016. I didn't see him for six months. So he, ha he literally had the engagement ring and couldn't give it to me because he couldn't yes. find me to give it to me. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's how ghost I was in 2016. Um, yeah. So it's just the physicalness of doing the job and, and really not getting and getting very little sleep and, and eating really bad food. Um, and then there's the actual like, what, where do you find news? So if Bernie Sanders is giving a very similar stump speech um, for 300 days straight. Where, how do you report on that in new and fresh ways? So it's really trying to figure out like, well, what makes this venue differently? How are these people reacting us differently? What's going on in the news that maybe Im impacts a certain part of this speech? So it's really trying to be creative with how you do that. And then of course, when it's interviewing the candidates, it's trying to get them off their talking points and trying to get them to reveal something and make some news. That's a pretty tough thing to do. So I think all of that is, was and, and still is really tough. And then when it comes to moderating a presidential debate, I get so nervous still when I'm on TV. Even when I was doing this Instagram live, I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna be talking. Like, what is this gonna mean? But at the debate, for some reason, I was like so calm. And it's probably because PBS just prepares you so much. We went over, we had a mock debate. We just had, we really, they really made me feel like I was part of this team and we had this shared goal and we all knew what we, what was gonna happen. And we knew that, and I knew the, um, the candidates really, really well, and I was familiar with their, what their points were. So in that regard, it's, it's, it was the preparation. It was just knowing your research. And for me, it was reading the questions out loud because I, I'm someone who talks naturally really, really quickly. I try to slow myself down when I can, but it's, it's making sure that you get into that mode where you look smooth on television, which for me, who came from print, who worked at the New York Times on a bunch of other newspapers, it's still something that I'm getting used to because there's a rhythm to TV. There's yeah. a rhythm to how you do it well. I mean, you can tell when someone's doing it really well. And when someone's doing it, that doesn't feel programmed. Like, I don't want to be like every other person on TV. I want to be myself, but still a little bit smoother with a little bit more swag. Yeah, yeah, you got to get swag in there. Exactly. <laughs> do you feel like the way that the primaries specifically, do you feel the way that they're covered has kept up with how we're now consuming media? It's like the the president, the Democratic primary was seemed wild this year. And it seemed like, if you hit at the right moment, it was good, but not. And it was less about like your overall, you know, substantive approach, but it's, it's the way we consume media is so bizarre now, so hard to keep up with. Do you feel like it's out of balance in some way, or is it just, it's kind of always been that way and it's just hard to cover because there's so many people and so much going on? I mean, obviously the Democratic primary this year was so huge because so many people were running. And I think news organizations really tried our best to give everyone 
kind of equal amounts of shine and equal amounts of time. But it was really, really tough. We try on NewsHour. I'm pretty sure we we interviewed almost, or if not all, the presidential candidates. Our anchor Judy Woodruff did that. I also interviewed people. Other correspondents did as well. So I think it's really trying to like be fair to people, but also realizing, okay, here are the top contenders. Because I know as someone who talks to my mom all the time, who, she's someone who is following the she was following the Democratic primary pretty closely. She was like, call me when there are like three people left, and I'm like, well, I'm moderating the debate. You should tune in. And she's like, fine, I'll tune in. But like, oh, I knew even then with, with like the political junkies that are my family members that even they were tiring of the way that some of the coverage was going. So I think that it was really about being fresh. And I think, of, of course, I think the PBS NewsHour debate was the best one because why not? Um, but I think that overall, I think our debate was really good because it was substantive. It was lively. Um, but, I, and I, but I think the tools to, to cover candidates are still evolving. I mean, the iPhone changes everything. The, the iPad changes everything. I've always been mm -hmm. joking that at some point we're going to be hologramming and teleporting into places. And we'll just, yeah. the technology will continue to help us cover things because things are moving so quickly. Someone's hot on, on Monday and then by Friday they've lost the primary and they're not, they're not particularly important anymore. I mean, I think about the South Carolina primary for for a while, Joe Biden was looking like maybe he might be faltering. And then the South Carolina primary happens and a number of people drop out and it's all about Joe Biden and, and Bernie Sanders. So I think in some ways reporters did the best that they could with the tools that we had. Yeah, I mean, it's so difficult. You're trying to, you know, be fair to 25 people or however many. It felt like there was 100 people in at one time. It's like, even if you have eight people, like how do you, you know, or five people, how do you be fair and give equal time and make sure everyone is, you know, being able to say what they want. Some people are better at it than others, but you know, that doesn't mean that they're the better candidate. All it, there's just like watching it sometimes. I don't know. I felt like your mom a little bit like, call me when less people are here. I'm trying to follow everything, but yeah, it's, it's a lot. Um, going back to your, uh, your correspondence post, is that something you kind of mentioned traditionally people would sort of have a long career and that would be maybe like, their last stop or somewhere where they stayed a long time. Is that still kind of true or is this, you feel like a, a good stop for you, but you have ambition elsewhere also? I, I'm someone who didn't start off my career coming wanting to be a White House correspondent. I just really wanted to cover my community. I really wanted to cover what everyday people were doing. Um, I came to PBS because I think I still have the opportunity at this organization to be able to still cover things like Ahmaud Aubrey while also covering the coronavirus outbreak while also covering the White House. It takes a lot of work and it's a little sleep, but it, it's a place that like understands that I have like all these different dimensions to me that I really want and, sh and need to feed. Um, so I, I think if this White House correspondent job as it is right now, I really, really like it. Um, I think that, you know, what happens in 2020 and what happens at the, I should say, November 2020 or what happens down the line, who knows where that goes. But for me, I'm, I'm having a great time covering the White House right now. I, I, I like it immensely because I can still go into people's living rooms. I still feel most at home and most, um, most and I feel most like I'm, I'm fulfilling my mission when I'm sitting on someone's living room table um, or sitting around someone's dinner table and talking to them just about life and hearing from people um, who don't get to be on the front pages all the time. So some of the stories that I'm proudest of aren't the ones sometimes that have made the front page or the ones that have been the ones that are like, um, the shiniest. I think about, I wrote a story about environmental justice and I ended up interviewing a bunch of people who do landscaping and talking about the idea that people that work outside are the ones that, that will first feel the impact of climate change. So I put, so we ended up having this man who's, who got his, got his picture on the front page of the New York Times. And he's someone who's cutting your grass. He's someone who doesn't think like, I will be on the front page of the New York Times. Yeah. That's to me is where I feel most fulfilled when I'm telling those stories. But I also think I'm covering a, a, a president um, that is just going to be so critical in American history. I think we're going to be looking back at President Trump first, how he how he got elected and how he happened and what the what the what the feelings of the country was um, when they elected him, and then also after. No matter what happens in November, there will be a chapter after this. There will be mm -hmm. maybe a Trump TV. There will still be all sorts of people wondering about whether or not America reflects them both white and black and Asian. So I think that to me, this is a, it's, it's a good perch in my mind to cover the world. And I feel incredibly blessed and inf incredibly grateful to be at the White House right now. Well, we feel the same about you. We, we are incredibly blessed to have you there. I feel like 
uh, for so many people, when your face pops up on the screen, you get your chance to, to ask your questions. Um, they probably, you know, won't be answered directly, but <laughs> we love your questions. Uh, we love, we love having you in there. I, I know for, for myself, it's been um, just so nice to, well, first of all, to, to have press briefings. We, we don't really um, get them very often. And of course, you know, we're in the middle of this crazy pandemic, but um, that is one question I want to ask you. So you, you started in 2018, January, 2018 as a correspondent. How yeah, was that first year compared, or the first, I guess, two years compared with with this? Like, w there wasn't a lot of press briefings, right? So what what was your sort of role? How, how were you operating then, or what was it like? Instead was the fact that the House Press Secretary, they didn't hold any any press briefing. So the last White House Press Secretary literally never had a press briefing. So she started the job and ended the job having never come to the podium, <laughs> having so never crazy. talked to American people. Um, so that was kind of wild. Um, so the first two years, but the first, but even with that, I should say, the access to President Trump has always been pretty open. It's just been kind of controlled on his terms. So for the first two years, what the president did was talk to media in the Oval Office kind of while he was meeting with leaders as a kind of aside, or he would talk to us regularly when he was walking to and from um, the White House to, to go to some trip. So you would, you would, that's the helicopter. The videos, right, of him yelling the over helicopter. The infamous helicopter interview. <laughs> and, you know, there were so many times where the president, what I think people maybe don't get, which it, but that's, that is obvious from when you're doing it on my side, is that he can pick and choose what questions he gets. So when you're walking to a helicopter, you can say, oh, I didn't hear her asking about testing, or I didn't hear her asking about the shooting of, of, of another unarmed Black man. But, you know, I did hear that question about immigration. I did hear that question about Comey or about um, Robert Mueller. So I think there was a, a control factor that the president could do. Then, of course, we got these daily White House press briefings where President Trump was coming to the podium almost every day. Um, and that was, uh, it was refreshing to be able to push back on President Trump, to be able to ask follow-up questions in a way that was civilized and that was not outside in the rain and snow, um, a, a, in, a, in a room that was designed to question the president. It was kind of remarkable that we could use that room in the way it was originally designed to do um, and to be used. But we also, then we saw the president and, and people around the president really start to get nervous about how much he was talking to the media. And the last real press briefing that we saw where things really went a different direction was when President Trump openly wondered whether or not people should inject disinfectants and light into their bodies as a cure for the coronavirus. After that, the president got so much backlash, including the president's own health officials through the, the, the CDC and other agencies. They had to warn people not to inject infectants into their bodies we saw an uptick in some cities, like in New York, for calls to people to hotlines where people were saying they had ingested disinfectants. And the thinking was in the White House that this was probably the moment where the president needed to step back and scale back the way that he was doing um, press briefings. So what we've seen now is the president go back to the way that he can kind of control what questions he answers and what questions he doesn't. So right now, what we're hearing from the president usually is him talking to some leader and then picking and choosing the questions. Um, reporters are still being able to ask follow-up questions, so that's a good thing. Um, and then, of course, we have a new White House press secretary, Kaylee McEnany, who has held now two press briefings. So that's two more than the last White House press secretary. He <laughs> says he's going to continue to do that. Yeah. I mean, it, it does go to show that, you know, what you just said about uh, what he said about the disinfectant. <laughs> Uh, you know, I think most people, you know, at the time were, were thinking, of course, we're not going to, you know, be drinking that. But it, it does show the importance that the presidency have in the pulpit of the presidency in a White House press briefing does hold, you know, so much power and so much sway. And I think, you know, as a country that's reeling um, and looking for that guidance, I think, you know, people are wanting that from him. They're wanting that guidance from him. So it makes your guys' job all the more important to... Um, report the facts and distill all of the information from not only the president, but, you know, the task force and the medical experts. Um, you know, there's, it's been probably the most memed thing <laughs> that we've had in a long time, the, the press briefings. Um, I keep saying that one of the most tragic things in this from a comedic standpoint is that SNL is not able, actually, um, I, I stole that joke from Sue, that SNL is not able 
uh, to be having their full broadcast right now because it would be uh, an absolute heyday on the press briefings. But it really does really show just amazing content right now. Yeah, yeah. I'm exactly. laughing at so much of what SNL is producing. Oh my gosh, it's so funny. Yeah. So it just shows, you know, how important your job is, um, you know, to get us the information that we need. Um, and so we're so thankful. I don't want to, I've already taken up 45 minutes of your time. I'm sure you're busy. I'd keep you here all night. But uh, yeah, we, we appreciate you so much. Um, I love the work that you're doing. Um, and you're just uh, bringing it to us real every day with that little bit of swag, like you said. Well, I really, really appreciate you inviting me to come on here. I was, again, kind of starstruck because you are such an American icon. You're such a national treasure to us um, that I am so excited to be in conversation with you. And I'm so excited that people feel represented um, through me at the White House. I think the, the my main mission, my main goal is to hopefully people will look at my questions and look at me and think not only is she representing us and the American people, but she's doing it well with a little bit of swag. Um, so I really appreciate that. Oh, of course. Next time we'll go back to our normal. You can interview me and I'll, I'll get back to being my normal. So this is, I'm sweating. I'm nervous. <laughs> it's, it's, an, it's a funny position to be in having the roles reversed. So we'll, we'll have to do this again sometime. Awesome. Well, All right. Take care. Good luck in uh, your press briefing tomorrow. Awesome. Take care. All right. See you later. Bye.